I'm going to start with today's uh, lecture. That is coherent control of semiconductor quantum emitters. So this is sort of the second part of the nano optics uh, lecture. And I want to, you know, in the last lecture, I sort of took, talk about a general thing. How do we probe the optical property of a nano object, right? And how do we break, some of them to break the diffraction limit, but really a lot of time you don't really need to break the diffraction limit. You can still study optical property of a single object. Right? And so that's related to my research. And it has, of course, its, its a connotation in quantum information science. So I want to give you just a brief introductory about so-called quantum computation and quantum information. And you probably know that in technology, like silicon technology has been largely responsible for the exponential growth in information technology, right? And that is because this, the Moore's law tells you the, the number of the, of the transistor you can pack in on the chip grow ex exponentially. So they double for every 18 months. And this trend continue, right? So this plot, it was up to 2004, and now it still continue. But every indication is said it will come to an end. Right? So then how does, but you can see all the information in our science grows. The basic information, concept processing information, remain the same for the past 40, 50 years. It is the whole growth, now you use your iPhone, you use your computer chip, the computation power, this, this noble computer is, is probably 100 times faster than a supercomputer 30 years ago that occupied the whole building, right? These are all due to the fact that you can make the transistor faster, make more and more and more. But the way the basic notion about processing information is still the same, okay? All the information unit is still on and off, or the binary code of 0 and 1, right? So starting about in 80s, there are a lot of people try to really think about what could be, you know, what could be the fundamental limit of computation? What could be the fundamental limit of the information? And quantum information science sort of derived from that. And those, are, for quite a while, people think this almost just like a dream, right? You just imagine, when I first heard quantum, quantum computation, I said, oh yeah, you guys are just crazy. It will never be realized. So at the end, you, will, you can ask me, do I believe in quantum computer at the end? Okay, I will tell you what my answer is. It's a complicated answer. But nevertheless, so, the, so, so starting in 1980s, People try to say, well, let's try to use a, this information unit called quantum bit. So the difference between quantum bit and a classical bit is actually very little. It's still a two-level system. OK, it's 0 and 1. The only difference is for this fundamental unit, here in a classical unit, it can only be 0 or 1. But quantum mechanics, you know you can have a linear combination okay, of this two state. And so this two state will span a small Hilbert space. And this Hilbert space is just can be represented by this, and where this coefficient can be any complex number. The only requirement is the probability we'll have to conserve. So you can have time probability finding its up state, and the other half time finding is the down state. So now, this Hilbert space of this span by two level system, you know. So, so now, I, I want to use this. Uh, it's kind of quite amusing. You know, we start working on this field back in 2000 or 1999. And just in a few years, you can see this in Times Magazine, okay. So, so, so you can see this is a two edged sword, right. In, the scientists often want the general public 
to feel very excited about their research. So they can come out and give a very, very esoteric you know, projection and excitement. So <coughs> exciting the excitement from the general public you know, is a two-edged sword. The nice thing is we'll get maybe public support for us to continue to do this kind of research. But public, they are very impatient. So in a few years, if you don't deliver your promise, they come up, they will come back and punish you. So I think, so this represents sort of the peak of the time that scientists try to generate people's exciting excitement. And then this is, you, you all have heard this thing called Schrodinger's cat, right? So just, okay, Schrodinger's cat doing computation. So just, you can see the picture. It's a machine made of just 12 atoms could outperform the mightiest supercomputer. And it is really the quantum computation get people so excited is due to its exponential speeding up when the number of qubit increases. And I will not, I will just give you a, you know, it's almost impossible to say, well, in a short lecture, let you already understand what quantum computation is. But really, it based on this thing called is massive parallelism. So if I use this example, say I have two qubit, right? Two qubit, a two bit, usually you only have four number, right? So the num really what you care is also four number. But in the two qubit operation, if you use a quantum algorithm, what it happened is if you, you can create a superposition of all the four state, then all you need to do is just do one computation, just one operation, then you will find out the property related to all these four numbers. So that is really why the quantum computation is so exciting. And then you can see in the, this is the one that I say two to the n speed up is really in the doi josa algorithm. So you can speed it up. So this, you process four number at one time. Well, if you wanted to look at the property of four number, you have to calculate this number, calculate the property of this number, that number, and that number, calculate four times. So depending on the algorithm, you can either have a two to the n or two to the log two to the n, you know, it depends on what kind of algorithm you use. So, and we had a, we had a, you know, paper published in this too, but I will not talk about it. So, the key is you want to create a state that is superposition of all the basis state. And then just one operation simultaneously operating on all of those state. So, if you now have 12 qubit, right? Then you make two to the 12 operation in a classical computer. You can do it. If you deal it with the Deutsch algorithm, you just do it in one operation, then you find out the property. Okay, so that's why it's that. Now, <clears throat> I indicated for one qubit, it's a Hilbert space spanned by this two. But then there is another representation is what we call cubic sphere. It's like the other day when you guys had a party here, you have those, uh, is that famous Osaka food, it's called what? Somebody help me on that. Takoyaki. Yeah? Takoyaki, Takoyaki right? <laughs> and then you use your, use your, use your, 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 your what, uh, stick, right? You turn it, you are doing a cubic operation right here, right? Qubit rotation is any kind of quantum computation operation on a qubit is equivalent to a qubit rotation. Okay, so, so on this two level, why, why do I say that every state can be represented on, as a unit vector that form this qubit sphere? Because you say this is a general state, right? Then the idea is the probability distribution of the up and down together has to equal to one, so probability conservation. And then this can be complex number, the other one can be complex number. So the, the, what complex number give you is a probability plus a phase angle, right? E to the i phi. But for two state, if I want to look at their relationship, it's only their relative angle. Uh, so-called uh, phase angle is of any importance. So 
I can reproject this, I can make this transformation. Say, well, okay, I can make all of them to be real, and then this just represents the angle difference, the phase angle. And if I do that, then I can make another transformation because if the two real number, the square of two real number always equal to one, you know what that means? I can use an angle, theta, because cosine squared plus sine squared is always one. So therefore, if I just make this transformation, that alpha equal to cosine theta over two and beta equal to sine theta over two, then I satisfy this condition. So now, so once I have that, then I have, then everything here I represent by two angles. One is theta, one is phi. So theta, this angle, it is an angle ver against the North Pole. This is different from what you usually learn in spherical coordinate. In your normal spherical coordinate, that you always point the theta is against the North Pole. But in this case, it's against the South Pole. It's because when theta equal to zero, like when you don't do anything on this qubit, the state is in the ground state. Right? So theta would equal to zero. And then this, then any univector can be represented by this angle and that angle phi. And angle phi tell you what is the relative uh, angle, phase angle between these two states. And so now, and then and any quantum scale can be represented by a pseudo spin vector on the cubic sphere. And any unitary transformation you operate it is exactly a cubic rotation. And then this, if we go into, when we start trying to do the dynamic, we try to control, coherent control this cubic sphere, then if we use an external electromagnetic field, then we, will, we can make another projection, which may be something you are also familiar with, it's called block sphere. So block sphere and cubic sphere is basically the same thing except Block sphere is in rotating frame. Now we can come back, and then we will come back to talk about that. So this gives you a very basic of what uh, single qubit are. And choice of the qubits, you know, you have learned, you use atoms, ions, okay? And they are excellent qubit. The only problem is you cannot hold that qubit there all the time, right? It's very difficult to hold that atom, single atom, isolated from the, the environment forever. So if you make a qubit, you make a quantum computer, you have to make every second. It's very hard, okay? And solid state system is, oh yeah, people say, yeah, okay, once you make it, it's always there, right? It's fit with our old concept of computers. The challenge is in the solid state system, Every entity choice you use as a qubit compose of, is composed of millions of atoms or tens of thousands of atoms. And what is the phase coherence? They lose its coherent phase very qu quickly. So there is the coherent phase. Coherent time are usually much shorter. For a single atom, and they are isolated from its environment, so they have much longer coherent time. So each got its own advantage and disadvantage. So, and I will not say, well, what are, which one will eventually win, because I believe to make a real practical quantum computer, it will be, I don't need to worry about it. When after I die, I think still people will not make a practical quantum computer yet. Okay, so that's my personal view. But it doesn't mean there will be no progress. The progress is moving uh, very rapidly. And there are many different kind of choices of the, of the uh, uh, qubit. You can use a superconductor Josephson junction, and we usually call it a superconductor qubit. Or you can use single spinning quantum da, x time quantum da, imperial state, etc. And I will only today only talk about x in quantum dot.